34 years ago, I planned to arrive in this field in a balloon for a pop festival. Now, the balloon idea didn't work out because the wind inconveniently came from the wrong direction, but the pop festival, now that's a different matter. My band and I walked out onto the stage over there and into rock history. I am the god of hellfire, and I bring you fire. Well, that was me in 1968, the year of the first Isle of Wight pop festival. Two more festivals followed, each one bigger than the last. By 1970, the audience topped half a million. It was one of the most extraordinary happenings the country has ever seen. Not everybody liked it, though. A small and powerful minority of Ireland elders were outraged. Eventually, they forced an act of parliament that banned any such gathering ever again. And so it has remained until now. In the year of the Queen's Jubilee, the council have decided to revive the tradition. The Isle of Wight Festival is back. It's a return to Rock Island. If this is correct, and it does actually contravene English law, then it throws the whole of the risk assessment document into disrepute. It's not my idea of rock and roll, <laughs> but it's what you have to do if you're going to put on a big rock event nowadays. There is still an opportunity to add supplementary conditions to, to those conditions already imposed. We want to do it small to begin with so that everybody feels comfortable with having people come back because they've avoided it for 30 years now. So, you know, we need to build it slowly but surely to reassure these people that it is worth doing something. But I think it's great to put the island back on the map. The 1968 festival began very simply. We're in the process of helping raise funds for the local swimming pool association. And it was decided that why not have a concert or a, a festival of some sort. And we moved to the idea of having a one day festival. So that was the, the start of it, with a one day festival to raise funds for the swimming pool. My brother Bill was at the Royal College of Art and he, was, he had his finger on the pulse of who was important. So you contact their agents and book them and then you book a field or a farm and start putting a show together. We had Arthur Brown, who's number one in the charts, and of course we had Jefferson Airplane, who were coming over to Europe, and th there wasn't really a proper arena. The stage was a, a couple of um, trailers put together with a bit of a canopy, and we had Jefferson Airplane come to do their superb light show on this situation. And then there was the wilder element. One of those bands whose notoriety made the Rolling Stones look like mm, the singing nuns was my old mate, the pretty thing. We did one gig where I made larger than life cutouts of the band. And we stood behind them, apparently, for about 20 minutes, playing behind these cutouts. We forgot that we were actually meant to come out and stand in front of them. And, you know, we, and all John said was, when he was playing the keyboards, he couldn't understand why some bastard had made some of the notes white and some of them black. The Isle of Wight wasn't really alcohol-based. I mean, that was the wonderful thing. In lots of ways, it was kind of quite healthy. Um, you know, it was a sort of um, country fair atmosphere to it as well. It seemed just perfect to go out into fields and play music, and it felt so right. And all the people involved weren't really what you call professional. You know, you weren't dealing in the same way as you would say if you played the Apollo in London, a, a normal theatre. One scene that sticks in my memory was at about four o'clock in the morning, we'd had some drizzle. Not very much, but the youngsters gathered the stubble and, and <laughs> lit it. <laughs> and you looked out over the field and it was like a field of stars in the dark. Uh, these glowing little fires. And it was such a marvellous sight. Yes. You are a 
a little ladybird. Ooh. I remember seeing Arthur Brown on numerous occasions, and obviously I must have seen him there. The only people I can remember, oddly enough, are the Jefferson Airplane, and that was largely because before they went on, this uh, young woman that was complaining about how cold her feet were, and in the Arthurian tradition, as I saw it, but also with the hope of getting some kind of favours in return, I have to be honest with you, uh, I gave her my socks, and she uh, disappeared into the night uh, with my socks, and I ended up with very cold feet. <laughs> I'm not going to dance with my princess by the light of a magical moon. I'm not going to dance with my princess by the light of a magical moon. We thought it was successful enough to encourage us to really do it properly the following year. The main thing that we'd learned was you, you really needed a big star in order to get people to come to the Isle of Wight. Dylan's name was highlighted as being the obvious one because he was a major name and um, it seemed unlikely we could get him but we thought we'd try. At first we were turned down flat and said no way, he hasn't worked for years, he's not likely to. And of course, we just wouldn't let go at that point. We just kept on and on and on. And um, we, we had a, a conversation probably two months before the event with Bert Block, who was Dylan's agent and manager. He said that Dylan's kind of interested. He wants to know more about it. The following day, we had a set of three books together with a film of the site that we posted off Express airmail on the Saturday lunchtime post and they had it on Monday morning. I think it was about a week after that they came back and um, the only thing I remember about the phone call was having to sit down. <laughs> I was standing there at a, at a table on the telephone I had to sit down and um, he said I've just sent you a, a telegram to confirm that uh, Dylan and the band will accept. We wanted to see the home of uh, Alfred Lord Tennyson. There was a real connection between the Victorian eccentrics, Tennyson, Mrs. Cameron, G.F. Watts, Charles Darwin, who were you know, all lived around here um, and were, used to come here for, for meals and conversation, and Leonard Cohen, Jenny Mitchell, Bob Dylan, Jimi Hendrix, the great artists and writers and musicians of the 1960s. I mean, Dylan only came to the Isle of Wight because of the promise of seeing Farringford, yeah, Tennyson's uh, home. Uh, it's been noticed in certain quarters you haven't been making your views known on the situation of drug taking among teenagers and young people these days. I don't have any of those views. I wish I did. I'd be glad to share them with you, but I... I think everyone should lead their own life, you know? you realise when you get there is that the running order that's pinned up on the wall goes straight out the window mm. because um, nothing uh, nothing takes five minutes to set up or and the changeovers people are always overrun somebody gets really stoned and does an incredibly long solo or something like that so you're supposed to be on at one o'clock in the afternoon and at one o'clock the following morning you're probably still waiting one minute they're saying can you go on at six and like you say okay yeah start getting yourself together and then they say, no, no, it's all right, Moody Blues are going on. And then the next thing was Moody Blues management saying, no, my lads, I got to they're not going on till, till it gets dark and the lights are working properly because we've got these special effects. And so this was going on with, you know, helicopters landing and, and sort of taking off and it, the, the backstage was full of everybody who was anybody. I can see When it got to the evening of the event, the people who were allocating passes to, to get in uh, from the press office were obviously letting senior people in, and, and before they knew it, the whole thing was just full out with journalists and celebrities, and 
Um, then other people arriving with, with press tickets that couldn't get in. So at one point we had to empty the press arena and reissue tickets. There were people as far as the eye could see. I mean, it was just, it was surrealistic to, to just look and not be able to see where the people ended. Dylan was waiting to go on, and I just happened to be there outside his caravan. And we talked for a long time, and I, I, I consider that one of the little islands of, um, you know, of, of, of memory that, that I'll always cherish. He was very nervous about going on. And the band went on longer than he thought they were going to. And um, he kept saying, you know, um, gosh, they, they're really going down well. And, and, I, and um, I wonder how long it's going to be till I got it. Because what happened was that this festival went on so long that by the time he got there, people had been there a long, long, long time. There may have been a sense in which people didn't really believe he was ever going to show. Because this was like the, the second coming. This was like the Messiah. <laughs> A, a roped off area at the front with the sort of lardy dars of the rock <laughs> industry like the stones and whoever was hip at that particular week and none of the rest of the people on it who actually played in this concert could get in and we all wanted to see um, the band I wanted to see the you know it's Bob Dylan with the band and it's like well you can't get in here mate you know well, you have to go around the back and that and so I, I took one sort of run and hurled myself into all of these uh, you know, these uh, rock aristocracy pe people, and there is Bob Dylan, and everything, and then got chucked out again. <laughs> After the Dylan concert, the island's anti festival campaign really took off. Leading it was the local member of parliament. Well, Mark Woodnut wrote a piece in the Isle of Wight County Press following the Dylan festival, and he talked about an indescribable scene of filth and litter. And they, they said the most hateful things about people. Now, I'm, I'm sure there were people around who were leaving litter. I mean, you're going to get that sort of thing, you get it at Glastonbury now. But it, it doesn't mean to say that people are, are beneath contempt and people are like animals in the way that would have been described. People have since referred to it as the, the previous Holocaust. You know, is they're, they're, they're that outrageous in their opposition to, to actually go as far as using a word like that. I mean, that sort of says it all, doesn't it? Ranting opponents were not the only problem facing Ray and the brothers. We also had difficulty in how to follow up Bob Dylan. Who, what do you do next, you know? And we were talking to the Beatles, for instance, trying to persuade them, but they didn't want to know. And so we decided to get a raft of names, and uh, the top names around, and sort of Hendrix and Joan Byers. And then we're bringing in, you know, Lenny Cohen and Joni Mitchell, and then the current British groups of 10 years after, Jethro Tull, um, ELP did their, their debut. This raft of big names was supposed to be the equivalent of having one superstar. So now the Fuchs brothers have all their artists booked, but they don't have a location for the venue. So they go to the north, an injunction. They go to the south, another injunction. They go to the east, injunctions everywhere. Reluctantly, they went west. It was the least accessible part of the island, but it was home ground for the Fook brothers. The opposition called their usual meeting in the village hall and for the first time found themselves outranked. It was packed with, with local people that we knew. We hadn't organized this, they just turned up. We then ran an, an orderly meeting in which we took questions about what we were doing to reassure people and it was a very good meeting and we never looked back really. I'd read about the festival and it just sounded like 
this was something when I had to be out. It wasn't because of the music, it was the event. It was obviously going to be very, very big, and it just seemed like it was going to be an interesting thing. Tent, sleeping bag, and a minimum of um, stuff. I was very conscious every single person there was young. There were not old people there. This was, this was the whole 60s generation. I guess we felt it was the last chance before we had to become grown-ups and start smoking pipes. All the people who lived on the Isle of Wight, they were actually making sandwiches and putting drinks out for people because they thought it was wonderful. I mean, whether they did at the end of it, I have no idea, but the uh, original part of it, to see all these you know, young people coming from literally all over the world coming to the Isle of Wight. You've gone from strawberries and cream tea parties to uh, rock and roll. Uh, that's a giant step for mankind. I was travelling there with the underground press contingent uh, the idea was that various people from the three leading underground newspapers and magazines at the time would join forces and they'd go up there and they would produce a daily festival newsletter with, you know, a bunch of, a whole load of paper and a Gestetner machine, which is what we had in, instead of desktop publishing back in the late Paleolithic era. VD scare is bullshit. Stories of a VD academic carried by the BBC and the Evening Standard are complete fantasies. And I was amused as little small ads in one of these. There was someone who was trying to find a home for three tailless kittens. People were taking it very seriously as, as a community. I mean, I think the organisers were quite worried about this, but it was, it was, it was wonderful having twice, two or three times a day in a newspaper that told you what was actually going on. I was very much the new kid on the block, and I had been picked up by a very good, aggressive New York manager called Joe Lustig. He said, I got you, I got you, I got you on, uh, on the Isle of Wight, Ralph. It's going it's to be great, it's going to be great. I said, well, one bloke with a guitar is what I said. I can remember thinking, how the hell? Uh, and he said, you'll be great, you'll be great. Do Streets of London, do the, do the ragtime. They'll like the ragtime, you know. I remember going for, to eat nut cutlets, thinking that was the right thing to do, because there were lots of food concessions and things. That was very well organised. It wasn't overpriced at all. I mean, that, that side of it had been organised well. I think the most dangerous part, potentially, was after you'd gone to sleep, you could have been burnt alive because most of the people there didn't have money, so they would just go and find something to burn to keep themselves warm. And a lot of people didn't have tents. I mean, I woke up to find there was an extra person in our tent. We was a two-man tent with my friend Ray and I, and we woke up and there was another guy in there. It was all good vibes and everything because he, poor chap, hadn't got anywhere to sleep and it just wedged himself in. My ego was kept to, to an absolute minimum because I didn't even have a, a dressing room. I think I had a peg hanging on the wall for me jacket, as I recall. Uh, I don't think I'd wash my hair. I hadn't trimmed the guitar strings. And, and it looked like sort of studied nonchalance, but I was actually shaking in my boots. I mean, I went out on that, that stage, and it was just, it was unbelievable. The st it was like looking at an ocean of people. I don't, it's like Wembley. You don't remember your 45 minutes, you know, you just know that you were there. Nights in white satin Never reaching the end Letters I've written Never meaning to send Again in 1970 we were, we were late going on, but as it happened we had then a, a lovely spot, I think it was in sun, about sunset, yeah. and the reception for us was great. Just people as far as the eye can see, and it was a, a, a beautiful sight. long, long way back, I don't know, 200 yards from the stage, but it really didn't matter because that wasn't the point. You could certainly hear things, you could hear the music well if you were inside the arena, and you could also hear it beside the arena. And then when we left the queue for a bus, which was a good two hours queuing for a bus, the music was very loud, and it was no different really from listening to it inside, except we were standing up in a bus queue, but free were extremely good, as I recall, in the bus queue. <laughs> Nearly 600,000 people came for the last festival and none of them would ever forget it. 
Unfortunately, too many of them enjoyed it without paying. Endless delays over the venue had caused chaos with ticket sales, and worse, the eventual location was overlooked by hills with a free grandstand view for thousands of spectators. The organizers lost their shirts. The opposition, who found plenty to be outraged about, gathered strength. Within months, the local MP, Mark Woodnut, moved the Isle of Wight bill, banning any overnight gathering of more than 5,000 people. I think you've got to give local authorities the power to say yes or no. See, at the moment, you have no control at all. You can't stop them taking place. It's politics, isn't it? They think that people with long hair, the subversives, they're going to threaten society, they're going to bring in communism, and they'll bring black power with them. I mean, it's outrageous, but this is the way people were thinking then, and some still do. We didn't set out to be subversive, but we found ourselves in a subversive kind of movement. And it's a very healthy thing to have. You need subversives, you need to challenge the, the status quo. There are young people on the Isle of Wight who should get entertainment as well, aren't there? One of the audience was invited back 30 years later by some enterprising councillors trying for another festival. I didn't realise that we had to sit in the council meeting and it was embarrassing how good they were with words, actually. I felt very um, lacking that day in terms of a presentation. I could feel it slipping away, at which point I thought, I should stand up and get counted and say, well, listen, I was here in 1970 with Hendrix. This is your one chance to do something. Let's give it a whirl. Then they voted in front of us. It was like a vicar of Dibley, you know, and the vote went 6-4 in favour of the event occurring. It was shocking. It was that close. Uh, but it was on. Good morning, Annie Horn. The council's leisure boss becomes yeah, acting head of rock and roll, hoping to sell 25,000 tickets. Mr. Fixit arrives. Mark Ward's organised rock events almost everywhere, except the Isle of Wight. There's a lot of assumptions going on here, which have come to hold us all. I can keep an eye on making sure it's done. I just done. want to make sure there ain't any surprises. And it's gone to the right person. They keep biting us in the arse. You guys know as well as you know, the pace at which this has moved just leaves me bemused. Yeah. Because it's just Things nothing change. changes. As soon as you two aren't involved, nothing happens. The authorities start off very wary, and with 14 different departments involved, life ain't easy. At the risk of repeating myself, I know I wrote it. <laughs> the council's event manager, Rachel Board, realises those pioneers were a bit special after all. Well, they were heroes, weren't they? They have given the Isle of Wight one of the strongest musical brand names of anywhere in the UK. Um, they did extremely well. And, um, you know, it was them who said that it's grown into a monster in 1970 and they won't be doing it again. Victims of their own success. All right, uh, Led Zeppelin, of course, Robert Plant, and Mark Ward, production manager of uh, the festival, is with me. In a nutshell, what do you do? Uh, turn that uh, glorious greenfield site with nothing on it uh, into a festival site with stages and catering and bars and... Uh, all the loveliness that is required to toilets. make a glorious event. Oh, lots of toilets. <laughs> well, I'm just trying to get a bit of background. All right, now, uh, Keith Morris is here, and uh, your, your uh, health and safety... Yes, and style, doesn't it, really? But, I mean, it does. Health and safety makes you sound like well, you, don't want it, you don't want it to happen. Well, that's, the, that's the basic difference between the 70s concert and no. How dangerous... Now, looking back with the benefit of hindsight now, how dangerous were the 60s and 70s? I mean, I know that they were in America, the Who lost quite a few people. Yeah, in the early yeah, yeah. 80s, yeah. Crowd, a crowd management, all of that type of issue is all dealt with and legislated now, so... Much be, safer? Or much safer. Well, look, good luck. Have a lovely day on the Isle of Wight. Thank you very much. Nice Thanks to have you weather, here. Incidentally. Yeah, this is it. Well, this is the sunniest place in Britain. The Isle of, you know, you the know Isle of the weather will probably be like this on the day. Now, now we're working on the fact that we're building all the rain in now, so when we come down here to set the show up, it's all sunshine. There we go. Um, ticket number 0001. The first Isle of Wight festival ticket for 32 years. Fast forward for three months and here's HQ for Rock Island. They're starting to build the arena. So I've got a header here, header there, waterproof and black right the way there. Well, well, the stage will be here, facing that way, so the audience will fill in this space. It's not the hugest arena, but I mean, with the number of people we've got coming, and we know we've got coming, it'll feel right. You know? There have been some big changes. Far from 25,000 fans, they're now expecting under 10,000 and some early rain. We had some of that in 1968 and wind. 
I had to relight my hat. What's the gig like? Well, I'm sorry I missed the local band, The Bees, but I do really like this set from The Coral. For high energy, the early crowd pleasers turn out to be A Hundred Reasons, a band on the up. Ah, here's the council's head of rock and roll. How are you feeling, Annie? Nervous anxiety. I'm not sure it's enjoyment. This is a high-profile launch to a two-week festival. We try to spread it all around the island, you know, and our slogan is more people, more places, more music, and that's exactly what we've achieved. Real good um, feeling here, real good vibe from everybody that I've spoken to. Um, so maybe I am enjoying it, but I'll be glad when it's over. <laughs> Festivals are always great for seeing old friends and meeting younger musicians. There's a lot of talent about it. This, if you didn't know, is Ash, a really nice bunch. We we're going to be introduced by a living legend. Yeah. <laughs> oh, is that true? Yeah. <laughs> Can't wait. Do you know what you're going to say? Um, no, not yet. Yeah. No, I, I, I used to Just don't set us on fire. <laughs> Please. I've, I've gathered musically you have no need of being set yeah, on fire. Yeah, yeah. We're going to go for it anyway. Thanks very much. a bit churlish to mention ticket sales and the important thing today is that no one upsets the locals in fact everyone's having such a great time john the rock guru seems ready to buy the place i think there's room on the festival calendar to create a new event you know on the same weekend it's a bank holiday weekend yeah the white's a fantastic destination look around here it's brilliant and it's yeah. like going on holiday it is and it's really easy to get to that's the bit people don't understand everybody that's turned up today I said, blimey, I was in London two hours ago, you know? Yeah. I said, yeah, it's actually not in France, it's off the edge of England, you know? <laughs> but because you do go across the water, it's like coming into a different land. Yes, it's, de it's definitely a different sensation. That water is a psychological barrier, isn't it? It is. But the ferry is part of the experience. The ferry is fun, <laughs> isn't it? Quiet now. It's Robert Plant. <laughs> Walk me out in the morning and do money. Walk me out in the morning and do the day. Well, in 1968, my band and I started the first cycle of festivals on the Isle of Wight. And today saw the beginning of, hopefully, another cycle. The headline act this time are the charlatans. If they follow my tradition, they'll be back for a guest appearance at the festival in uh, 2034. And you know what? I may even try to make the gig myself. I am, after all, the god of hellfire. Oh. What are you sad about every day 
That's where rock and roll started, those kind of events. And to help recreate it is fantastic. It's part of my life. I went and bought those records. I went to the shows. There's Woodstock in America and the Isle of Wight in England. And uh, the two things are pinnacles of rock and roll history. I mean, it's taken us 32 years to come round. So that's really good.